Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to SunCup Global Summit 2022 at a session building a vibrant childhood community for startups in India. Let me start this session with this little piece of steel, a tree. The key helps you to open the door and helps you to step inside the place, helps you to feel home and safe. Feeling safe means being self assured, which is the first step to grow. Growth on the other hand side is the key of startups and scale to become successful and also means that they are solving problems of people. And today we're talking about the problems of 1.6 billion people who still live in inadequate shelter. And to solve this problem, we have to build a strong and vibrant shelter tech community with an interconnected multi stakeholder ecosystem. And today we have this strong ecosystem, this key to success in this session. So please welcome with me Yuri Bodella, the CEO of the Fabo Robotics, Anand Aravamudan, the Decker Lead Climate Action and Innovation Foundation, Gautam Kot, Brigade Reeves CTO, and Tarun Shami, the CEO and founder of Greenjax. And Ms. Angusta, I'm the Director of Entrepreneurship and Innovation at Habitat for Humanity. Dear ladies and gentlemen, we hope that you will leave the session by following three points. One, valuable insights from these important stakeholders you will hear very soon. Two, that many answers are provided to your questions, which you are also having. And please also ask them as we go along. And three, knowing why shelter tech is important. Some of you might not think, wait, shelter tech, what? What is this? So let's start with the definition first. Shelter tech is the term used to describe new shelter or affordable housing technologies that seeks to solve the challenges of the 1.67 people who still live in inadequate shelter today. This can range, for, for example, from material innovation to financial solutions to also water and sanitation or energy. Habitat for Humanity has the goal that shelter tech becomes one of the top five impact innovation categories, such as health tech, for example, or also climate tech. And so we as Habitat for Humanity have skin in the game and created some shelter tech initiatives, such as accelerators, or also tracks to support start startups, partner up with ecosystem players, and also to bring the term to a bigger audience, such as you, ladies and gentlemen here, so more people can actually support shelter tech startups and with that create more solutions that can then radically improve the lives of low-income families. So are we all set? I hope so. Then now comes what all of you have been waiting for. We are introducing the panelists. The panelists will tell us where they sit currently and also what their organization does and how they are involved in shelter tech. Let us start with Siri Modella. She is the CEO of Favo Robotics. Hi, everyone. So thank you, uh, Lisanne, for the kind introduction. So it's a pleasure being on this uh, platform here. Uh, at Fabo Robotics, we provide construction automation solutions that are affordable. So with these solutions, we bring in a minimum of 10x productivity and thereby reduce the cost of construction. So if you look at the current construction industry, that are uh, current construction industry, the activities that are involved in home building, Majority of them are extremely labor dependent, highly ineffective. So they are inefficient, mundane, repetitive. So and the current Indian construction industry is suffering from huge skill labor shortage. To address this, we are currently developing a robotic platform that performs construction 3D printing and automates various activities like brick masonry, plastering, painting, material handling, etc. So our recent, with our recent prototype, we have tested our uh, machine for construction, 3D printing and brick masonry. So, and we, yeah. Thank you very much, Siri. Let's go next with Anand Aravamutan. Thank you so much, Lizan, and uh, thank you, Sankal, for this opportunity to be a speaker on this panel. Um, I uh, represent Wilgrow, uh, India's oldest and largest uh, social enterprise incubator, where I lead the uh, climate action sector. 
uh, Bill Grow has incubated uh, more than 400 um, uh, social enterprises over the last 21 years. Um, and, uh, you know, by incubation, uh, what we mean is, uh, of course, financial support, but also uh, support in the form of uh, mentoring, technical assistance, go to market, fundraising and so on. Uh, all in all, uh, helping to make these enterprises um, viable businesses and scalable businesses. Uh, we are also very delighted and honored to be partnering with the Habitat for Humanity to run a shelter tech accelerator, which probably we will speak about uh, in, in the rest of the panel. Uh, thanks, Lizanne. Thank you so much. And let's go next with the Gautam Kotis, the CTO at Bibliotheca. Thank you, Lizanne, and thank you, Sankal, for having me uh, on this, uh, you know, it promises to be an excellent uh, chat. Uh, and many of uh, my fellow panelists have known in the past, and I absolutely can vouch for the excellent work that they've been doing in, uh, in the area of uh, technology in the real estate sector, as well as I want to call out Shelter Tech specifically uh, that, uh, you know, we work with uh, pretty closely at Brigade Reap. So Brigade Reap, uh, just a quick uh, word on Reap. Uh, we are the earliest prop tech focused uh, startup accelerator out of Asia uh, and have mentored over 50 companies, uh, 50 startups in the past six years or so uh, that are adding uh, a tremendous value to the uh, real estate and construction ecosystem, not just in India, but globally. And, uh, you know, we've had a pretty interesting ringside view of the uh, digital transformation that is happening, not for one or two large real estate developers before the entire industry, uh, all the way down, uh, you know, uh, you know, in various strata that I hope to cover uh, as, as a part of this chat. So happy to be here. Thank you so much, Gautam. And we have Jamin Jami, founder and CEO at Green Jams. Hey everyone, uh, pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Sankal, uh, for, you know, uh, having me here and uh, giving my inputs. Um, so at Green Young, we basically make carbon negative uh, building materials from uh, crop residues and industrial uh, byproducts for up to 50% uh, lower construction costs and up to uh, 3.5 times higher uh, thermal insulation. So we are essentially uh, making construction affordable right at the construction stages, but also uh, cheaper to operate uh, over the long term. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm especially thankful to... Um, Belgo and Shelter Tech for actually supporting us uh, in our journey and uh, super happy to contribute today. Thank you so much to everyone. So let's start with the questions. And again, audience out there, uh, feel free to also drop your questions into the chat and we'll be happy to take them up uh, within the discussion, not after, but within during the discussion. So okay, let's start with you. Um, you I mean, you mentioned before uh, about Hubble, Robotics, but really, like, what challenges are you solving within your startup? Okay, so uh, talking about the key challenge uh, in in the construction industry, there's already construction automation that is existing, but uh, the problem with these existing solutions is that they are either very expensive, or they are bulky, or both. For example, if you look at a construction 3D printing robot, it costs a minimum of a crore. It's the same case with a bricklaying robot. And a painting robot costs somewhere between 30 to 50 lakhs. So we have single robot for each application. What exactly we are doing at Fabo Robotics is we are building a modular robotic platform that can be used for various applications based on the requirement just by changing the end effector. So um, with this, we can reduce the initial inertia that is there in a lot of parties to incorporate technology into uh, their construction activities. Um, that is number one. And when we look at uh, the builders and developers point of view, there's not a single technology that is economically viable for mid-range builders and developers. So that can be addressed with our affordable robotic solutions. This is number two. And these robots will help reduce the amount of physical strength that is required. So it really helps us in opening doors for women to take up the role of operators of them. And uh, so we can see start seeing a lot of women on site, not just in the 
uh, uh, labor uh, point of view, but also in terms of people who can uh, take the project forward, like site engineers and operators. Thank you very much. Yeah. So in the next six months, what are actually your needs of support? And also do you fundraise? How 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 made the capital aim? Okay. So uh, recently we've raised funds from Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs in the form of a grant. And these funds will be used exclusively for product development. So the plan for the coming six months is initially we'll be hiring software and hardware teams. We'll be churning out prototypes very quickly. So we, we would uh, require uh, help in terms of getting access to the market so that we can validate and test the prototypes as in when we build. And uh, uh, once we reach that stage, we will be looking to raise funds to set up marketing, sales, uh, operations for the commercialization of the product. Thank you. Just one follow-up question. So if you are selling sure. to the market, what exactly would your wish list include? Uh, can you please repeat that question, Lizanne? Is it my microphone? Yeah, now it's clear. Okay. Uh, my question was, you said before you need access to the market. And uh, hmm. what will be on your wish list? Okay, so definitely with the help of uh, uh, REAP team, we'll get access to the brigade. And uh, um, we are definitely looking to get in touch with uh, Shapuji Palanji because they are already investing in startups which are uh, addressing the these problems with a bricklaying machine. So they might have a good perspective into how these machines can bring value to the builders and developers. So that is one company that we are looking at. Thank you very much. Let's yeah. move on. You know, together with Habitat Shelter Venture Lab in India, you're actually supporting startups with catalytic funds. So those are grants up to 25K and they're being used for projects to get closer to the affordable housing segment. Uh, what are the projects the startups are actually implementing? implementing? Well, Lizanne, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, and firstly, uh, you know, I, I must congratulate uh, Habitat for Humanity for taking a much wider view of shelter tech and actually looking at shelter tech as anything that makes a house safe and livable. Uh, so, uh, I, I, and just for the benefit of the audience, this includes uh, not just the materials, not just the construction processes, but also the financing, um, uh, also the, you know, accessibility, the transparency of, you know, uh, being able to uh, buy a house or acquire the titles to a house and so many other things, uh, you know, which, which form the complete picture of uh, a shelter uh, which, which, a, which a family uh, needs, right? Uh, so very much in tune with this philosophy, I think we at Wilgro have been scouting out for uh, companies, uh, you know, which we can support through the accelerator. I think we would have looked at close to 100 applications uh, across the spectrum. Uh, right now, we are working uh, with about, um, uh, uh, I think, six companies, um, primarily uh, uh, the, the purpose of the accelerator is to facilitate pilots. Uh, which means uh, to sh to um, enable these uh, startups, these enterprises uh, to uh, to to do um, to to do showcase projects, which uh, showcase both the uh, you know the the product which they are uh, or the service which they are um, uh, marketing, but also uh, the viability uh, to test out the business viability. So uh, along these lines, we uh, the the we've broadly speaking working in two areas. One is building materials. Uh, and here I must add that, uh, you know, at Will Grow and with the support of the Habitat for Humanity, um, we have brought in the sustainability lens as well into the building materials. So all the companies we're working with, and Tarun will speak about it, I'm sure, when uh, when he gets his chance, uh, all the companies we're supporting under the uh, accelerator uh, for the building material space do work on uh, environmentally sustainable and uh, climate positive uh, materials. Uh, so we have uh, green jams and I'll let Tarun speak about that. Uh, we have Zeran, which is uh, basically using plastic uh, infusion into bricks, uh, which uh, significantly brings down the cost of the bricks. Um, and uh, uh, similarly, we um, so uh, 
uh, in in this way we uh, you know also have uh, you know are, are able to showcase that uh, when we look at shelter tech uh, you know with a new lens uh, we we also see that uh, you know the climate angle can be brought in uh, right from the get go uh, on the uh, on the financing and the transparency front we have a couple of pilots going on um one um, is uh, with a company called Navank which is uh, basically uh, enabling better access to housing in tier 2 tier 3 um, towns and this is uh, achieved by basically it's a fintech company a financial company which is um, allowing better evaluation of properties uh, using parameters that typically have not been used uh, so far or you know basically bringing out bringing about uh, you know the power of digital technology into these uh, smaller towns um and uh, we also have bandhu who incidentally is a sankalp awardee uh, in, in in this version who um, uh, uh, allows better access to housing uh, for uh, migrant workers and uh, other such communities who typically have been at the mercy of uh, landlords and so on uh, so all in all i think uh, you know uh, looking at this uh, wider spectrum of shelter tech and supporting pilots uh, across the board uh, uh, one thing of course again on the building materials i'd like to mention is that a lot of them uh because they have this uh, green angle they need to get certified so as part of the pilots we are also supporting them uh, uh either in the life cycle analysis or the environmental product declaration uh, all of which become very very essential if they are to go and uh, bid for larger housing projects uh i'll stop there lizan and i'm sure uh, you know i can describe more in the next round but uh, back to you now thank you very much anand um, i hope my earphones um work a bit better now um Oh, so you said you are going, you know, you're bringing in the sustainability factor already from the beginning, right? I mean, a lot of startups have been around since since a while and they have a working product. Are you supporting them in, you know, the growth of their own um, businesses or are you, you know, bringing in new angles in their projects? Uh, i would say it's a mix of both um, so typically uh, yes the, the startups are already working on certain aspects and uh, typically we do screen and and look for those uh, sustainability um, you know component to the work that they do but then we bring in new aspects especially uh, in in kind of encouraging them to get themselves certified uh because this helps in two ways firstly uh you know if they have a proper kind of a either a certification or at least a deeper analysis of uh you know their environmental uh, the sustainability of their products uh this helps them to bid for larger projects this helps them to um uh, to uh, to work with uh, much more formal uh, kind of uh, or larger organizations and secondly this is a, again a wish list but i think we will try to make it uh, or try to fast track it is that they can also then start tapping into the uh, either the carbon or the plastic offset market and this is uh, actually going to be a very uh, significant uh, income stream which will actually enable uh, you know both the uh, cost of the housing to come down uh, as well as you know provide an alternate income stream so um, yeah i think it, this is the new aspect that we are bringing in lisa Thank you so much. Um, let's move then to Tarun. So you are absolutely in, in the sector, right? Uh, combining you know, CO2, or reducing CO2 footprint, um, and you know, building the green jobs to prevent thousands of tons of CO2 emissions. Is this actually something uh, people are considering in their decision making if they're buying aquacrete or your product? Yeah, for sure. So, um, I mean, uh we've been around since only 2019 and we started supplying only uh this april uh 2022 uh but having said that um during the entire product development process the entire uh, development phase from you know from the moment that we've started up uh the the focus had been um speaking to architects um developers um you know uh, contractors and so on to identify um what the problems are and then how we can uh, come up with solutions for those um and one of the things so back when we started in 2019 um sustainability was uh, one of the top 10 reasons for sure it was somewhere around uh, 7 or 8 um and one of the uh, top 10 parameters that you know buyers would look at when they uh, purchase a house an office or something 
but for the first time in 2022 according to a jll report uh sustainability made it to top 3 in fact it's the number 2 decision uh it's it's actually one of uh, it's it's the number 2 uh, decision making parameter uh that that uh, you know tenants are considering when they're uh, looking at um you know procuring uh, an office space or maybe uh, even residential space so there's definitely a turn towards this and uh, this the sort of a sentiment is also being um you know reciprocated by uh, some of the largest uh, developers in the uh, industry so you're talking about people like dlf um uh, in fact lodha essentially made a commitment that you know they would go net zero uh, by 2030 um there are obviously multiple pathways so i mean you have companies like shell who have massive uh, afforestation and reforestation projects which they use to offset their scope one scope two and even scope three emissions um which again you know turn into an additional revenue stream and then uh, through the voluntary carbon markets again uh, through which you know they're also able to monetize these uh, benefits so there are quite a few interesting um uh, models that are emerging at this point where uh small and uh, extremely large businesses alike are looking at the sustainability for multiple reasons not just because you know uh, you need to save the planet but also because uh revenue and money making uh has now become tied to this entire uh, process and you know you're you're talking about returns right uh returns is also something investors are looking at You know, your environmental friendly factor is it also supporting you in your investments or in your fundraising? So for sure, definitely. I mean, uh, we've already raised uh, two rounds of investment from uh, angels, and uh, in- interestingly, all of these guys, uh, you know, they put in the money simply because um, you know we're able to act- we're able to drive actual value when it comes to uh, sustainability and. Uh, carbon footprint which they also recognize that you know is going to be one of the largest uh, money movers uh, of our generation um, so i mean obviously uh, we need to do what needs to be done to uh, make the planet more livable uh, but along the way i mean uh, hey if you're able to uh, make money um, then why not thank you very much soon Katun, let's go to you. You know, we have been having to um, engage with the tax. I mean, you've been around since you've said it before. You are the oldest uh, real estate accelerator program in Asia. Um, how how did you experience now also the the shelter tech startups? Are they different to the ones you've been working from you know from the beginning with in the other cohorts? Yeah, I think you know it's important to set the context a little bit before I kind of. Uh, you know specifically address you know the differences or you know the perceived difference in the startups that we are onboarding uh, uh, in uh, collaboration with shelter tech so you know the real estate industry is a is a notorious laggard we all know that in terms of adoption of technology you know it's it's one of the least productive industries or sectors not just in india but globally right it surprises a few uh, that you know this this uh, Malaysia is not limited to the developing world i mean it's it's, it's pervasive all throughout you know including uh, the developed uh, economies where 80% of all projects typically tend to get delayed and uh, you know 20% of uh, them go way over budget on an average right so and then also you know you kind of have to factor in uh, the 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 flavor that the pandemic has thrown in uh, and it is been a you know it it has actually caused a, a positive change in the industry if there ever was a silver lining to the pandemic this is it i think it has kind of forced uh, the hand of uh, you know the important industry captains the stakeholders uh, uh, where you know people have embraced technology faster than ever before because it has directly affected their bottom lines uh, you know there has been an increased focus on uh you know less reliance on uh, you know manpower uh you know can they start adopting technology or automation more uh you know how do you improve or increase efficiency uh which people were oblivious to or were ignorant about earlier we are just seeing a lot of appetite uh, there as well you know more and more real estate developers but happily and it's probably a domino effect again a lot of investors are embracing uh, prop tech startups as well right and that is something that uh, is a one way change i think we're going to see more and more of that 
uh, happening for sure. Uh, now, you know, the cost of technology is obviously continuously dropping as well. And uh, it's made technology accessible to not just the, let's say, the luxury segment in the pyramid, uh, but it's kind of peers all the way down uh, through all the layers of the pyramid, uh, if you will, right? And that is where, you know, I think our partnership with uh, Terwilliger uh, and Shelter Tech uh, has come to the fore because these were, you know, it's an added facet that we've been able to add to our own, uh, you know, uh, offering as an accelerator. And that facet is basically uh, representing inclusivity. It's, uh, it's actually enabling total industry coverage that we perhaps were lacking before this, right? Now, uh, it still remains a challenge. I mean, Anant, you, you brought up a few names and we are, uh, we are familiar with all those companies intimately. Some of them we are working with, uh, you know, very closely as well. And that is where, you know, there is a challenge, you know, the lack of awareness that, you know, there is actually a, uh, you know, an attractive, profitable opportunity to be exploiting, you know, these opportunities that are opening up in this sector uh, that, you know, you tend to kind of ignore thinking, okay, you know, what is actually going to happen in this industry? We are talking about low income housing. We're talking about sustainability, which has got a long kind of a pole. Uh, and that is where I think our roles and I mean, the roles of especially all the panelists here, including the startups, is for us to kind of demystify that for more and more entrepreneurs to come in and, and embrace these uh, areas for, uh, you know, bringing in their innovative uh, entrepreneurial hats, you know. So, yeah, I mean, we're seeing the difference for us is, uh, you know, we were not very familiar with, with the domain. And I think, you know, we definitely, there's a lot of uh, learning that we've had to go. It's a pretty steep learning curve. But then it's also about, you know, what are the opportunities? What are the uh, pricing and business models uh, that startups need to adopt here? Uh, you know, how do you kind of price your uh, solutions from, from not just from this point on, but it needs to kind of feed into the kind of stuff that you're building uh, for, the, for the ecosystem. And that has been something that I think we've been able to uh, kind of get under the skin of, you know, and, and uh, I absolutely cannot underline the help that we've received uh, from, from all, the, all the people in the, on the panel for sure, I mean, one way or another. Thank you, Gautam. You just said demystifying. And it also means, you know, we need to create more ambassadors, more role models, and with that, more successful startups need to be out there so other startups and other accelerators and other supporters can join. However, um, what do you see as, you know, success factors? Could you also give some specific examples? Sure. So, you know, success for us, and see, we are definitely squarely in the business of enabling commerce and business for the startups that basically work with us, right? Now, if you look at uh, sustainability as a, as a sliver of, uh, you know, the kind of activity that our startups do, it was not a, you know, a core tenet when Reap started its life in 2016. But it turns out that almost 40% of our portfolio is squarely in the sustainability bucket. Now, the one common theme that we basically try and, uh, underline and highlight for all of our startups is that, you know, there is only one way that startups are going to get business from the real estate fraternity. You have either got to make them a lot of money or you've got to save them a lot of money, right? You might be, you know, if sustainability is, yeah, absolutely. As an activist, as, as a practicing, uh, you know, uh, citizen, let's say, you know, we do our bit where we, you know, you're, you're saying no to plastic, you're trying to conserve water, et cetera. But you have to understand that for a large developer, whether it is tier one, tier two in a large city or a small city, the only way that they can adopt a startup's offering is if, you know, it is making a difference to their bottom lines. That's the only way. And that is where I think what we try to do is to obviously highlight a lot of the positive impact that startups make, uh, you know, in, in terms of the efficiencies that they generate, but also, you know, how are they making their customers business is more successful as well. And that has to be, uh, you, know, uh, you know, something that we must highlight over and over again uh, for startups to be successful uh, in this space that we can make examples out of. And we've got plenty of those examples. I mean, I've, I've known Tarun for a very long time. He's not a part of the re-portfolio, but I'm a big fan of the kind of work that they do, uh, you know, where 
you need to have that kind of a patience to be in r and d for a while uh, to be convinced about the long journey that lies ahead of you for you to be able to make that difference maybe 5 6 7 years down the line after that initial idea hits you you know so it's not it's not it's not like a dot com startup that you know you you basically write your business plan on a on a on a napkin and somebody funds you and you are a unicorn at the end of the year it's never going to happen in this industry right uh, so i think it it's definitely a, a mindset change that that's got to happen thank you very much kamtha and you know you you just said that so maybe also we need to look at this from the number side and again we every time we're mentioning shelter tech or for the housing we are talking about this 1.6 billion people who live in inadequate shelter and yes this is of course like a huge impact number we have there but it's also a huge business opportunity here um and and I'll we'll go to you now the what is serving in you know many different regions and also sectors how important is then actually affordable housing for bilbo uh listen uh, uh, affordable housing uh, is an extremely important sector for bilgro uh because um, uh, as you correctly pointed out j- just the sheer potential for impact the number 1.6 billion uh, is quite an incredible number and uh, will grow was set up as a social business uh, uh, incubator uh, so what what better uh, uh, what more can we ask from a sector than that it impacts a lot of lives uh, so definitely in that sense um, you know housing is a very important sector for us but like i mentioned i think uh, also this fantastic opportunity to look at things uh, new when we are looking at this sector uh, to bring in sustainability to bring in digitization i think uh, you know this was mentioned multiple times in the panel that you know especially uh, in india today we see digitization getting into almost every sphere of activity and especially in the sphere of you know access to housing access to building materials um you know and and uh, transparency in in uh, yeah, in in allocations and so on there's a fantastic opportunity so these two forces that is uh, you know the the whole sustainability movement and the uh, digital movement when combined with the huge impact potential makes this uh, indeed a very very attractive and and important sector for will grow um though here i must point out one thing that um, you know uh, our experience over the last uh, 20 odd years is that um, you know there are basically two uh, in quotes uh, valleys of death which uh, entrepreneurs face one is the technical valley of death uh, where you know the product itself um, you know needs to kind of cross that in order to be a, you know the the for the product to be accepted and then there's a commercial valley of death which is essentially where uh, the business model uh, surrounding the product or service uh, has to succeed and uh, help to kind of grow the business right i think in the housing sector in the affordable housing sector the second one is the most difficult one to cross uh, the first one i think given the maturity of the startup ecosystem uh, the the kind of um, the ability and skill of our entrepreneurs uh, like uh, the the two we have here on this panel i think that takes care of this uh, technical aspect the technical value of death and and many of our entrepreneurs today are able to cross it the second one is where i think an incubator like will grow really needs to come in uh, to enable uh, some of the other aspects uh, of a business such as making connections uh, to uh, for example financiers financiers who will not only finance the enterprise itself but also finance the the users or the the customers of the what the enterprise is selling so you know if if uh, green jams is uh, trying to promote agrocrete and and uh, you know somebody wants to build a house using agrocrete then that should be finance available one of course for green jams itself but also for the customers uh, you know who want to build houses using uh, using this new material so i think all these connections um, and all these uh, you know go to market strategies is really what we are focusing on and i think particularly in this market there's a lot of there's a very large role for uh, somebody like uh, an incubator like will grow to play please sir thank you very much tarun anand just mentioned it right um, so again bring to market um, connections those are all important factors and you as an individual and also as women to have has been awarded multiple times congratulations by the way and this also means you know visibility for women what do you feel actually very helpful as a startup what factors are important for to support you uh, uh, the list is long it's really really long um i mean much like what gautam and anand had been speaking about the uh, uh, just just now um i mean anand made a great point about access to capital 
um, not just for us, but also for our customers, uh, especially when we're working in the affordable construction space at this point. And, and that's really interesting because uh, when we created the product, it was uh, predominantly focused uh, towards the development sector. We were, uh, you know, the the entire focus was on, you know, being able to support farmers and, you know, adding their income uh, through the collection of crop residues. And then, you know, also be able to sell um, in the rural locations where, you know, there aren't uh, many fancy uh, residences or uh, offices or, you know, high value uh, real estate. Um, but but soon after we started manufacturing and selling, uh, at this point, the entire uh, portfolio of uh, customers that we're catering to are either extremely large corporates or uh, um, uh, ultra high net worth individuals or, uh, you know, people who want to build their holiday homes somewhere up in the hills. Um, and, you know, folks are there. Uh, Despite us wanting to essentially sell, uh, you know, sell the product to uh, the grassroots, essentially the folks who would need it the most, at this point we're actually selling to people who, uh, you know, buy it just because it's carbon negative, um, and that actually uh, brings me to the most important aspect, which is essentially awareness and uh, education. You know, especially in the construction material space, uh, the space that we operate in, uh, we have. Uh, the industry is extremely fragmented. It's it's very, very decentralized. So the decision makers are not the ones who are building uh, the houses for themselves, but actually uh, the masons and the contractors who come and uh, build the houses for them. And that essentially means that, you know, you have to uh, educate your uh, uh, the masons. You have to educate the construction personnel. Um, you need to send the message out there in a format that is actually extremely easy for them to understand. And, and this is one of the biggest challenges that we face. How do we uh, convince a Mason that climate change is happening and that he needs to use this block? Uh, how do we convince a Mason that, um, you know, that there are existing bricks and blocks and that they cause so much pollution uh, and therefore they need to look for an alternative? Uh, and, and there are, are the obvious things about you know, the technical advantages, you know, how do I tell the mason that, hey, I mean, uh, these blocks have a higher splitting dead cell strength and therefore, um, I mean, this is something that not even the most educated people would understand. Uh, so it's 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 definitely down to the uh, the sort of communication that we're able to do uh, and, and therefore we need supreme amount of help there um, and, and that could come through various forms and partnerships. Uh, obviously, we need access to capital, uh, we would also need a uh, significant amount of um, visibility, uh, that, that sort of credibility that we need to build, and that would only come over a certain duration of time. It's, it's not like, you know, uh, one day, you know, you wake up, you say that, hey, I'm going to spend uh, a couple of millions of dollars, you know, do, do maximum amount of branding and, you know, make the product available for everyone to just procure. It's, it's, it's not as simple as that. Thank you very much, Tarun. Siri, let's, let's continue also with you. Can you explain or tell us more about how our robotics innovate today customers or who their customers actually are and how important you know, increasing awareness is? Uh, Lizanne, if you don't mind, could you please repeat the question? Uh, I think my network is not right. I'm not able to. Sure. Maybe it's also my microphone. So um, my question my question was, um, so Dermot just spoke about you know, customers, and yeah. could you maybe also tell us a bit more about your customers and how you get to them and how important in, you know, increasing awareness about your technologies is? Yeah, sure. So uh, coming to our technology, uh, the robots that we build, they will collaboratively work with unskilled or semi-skilled workforce. So... Uh, and this equipment will be actually used by contractors and builders. And in some cases, uh, the uh, huge companies also will be using it directly. Like they will be um, buying it from us and using it. So what happens here is we would definitely need, um, need some kind of awareness around how these machines work in collaboration with the workforce. Like we would need some kind of uh, process certification that says that yes, a machine can definitely work with the with the workforce 
and this is what the out can, outcome can be this this productivity it can improve the productivity by this much and by the end of the day the cost can be reduced by this much and you will not have to rely much on uh, uh, the workforce that is that there is a lot of shortage which is skill labor so we will need to uh, definitely uh, explain the contractors and builders about this and make them aware about the advantages about this technology Thank you, Siri. Um, you can ask me more of those from from related to just you know what what did you feel was most helpful also within that cohort? And then I would like to open up um, to the audience you know, this, the discussion round. So if you have questions, please drop them now into the chat. Okay. So uh, coming to the uh, brigade reap and shelter tech track, so they have uh, helped us immensely. uh in terms of uh changing our uh our approach uh we have started fiber robotic state out of college so we were always with this research centric approach but when we interacted with them constantly so our research oriented ap approach was uh changed into customer centric approach so we have received a lot of guidance in terms of customer validation as well so every now and then also i reach out to uh Gautam, uh, Mira, Deepak, Anu, uh, from Reap and uh, Shelter Tech. So, and apart from that, as a hardware uh, uh, entrepreneurs, the the it will take a good amount of time for us to finish the R and D and then get into the market. So, in that duration, we would definitely need a lot of support from the community. Um, so that is exactly where. we interact with other shelter tech startups on regular basis exchange information insights regarding the industry and also get their inputs so that's about the main uh, takeaways that we got from the shelter tech track thank you very much see yeah. someone you have a question uh, what change would you want to happen in the external environment especially concerning the governmental role and policy action uh, uh again it's 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 very interesting uh the question because uh you know some things like these have actually happened um in the past um especially when it came to uh fly ash bricks right um one of the so i mean if i were to just ignore the uh, the aspect about the government role and policy action um I, i would i would want um the external environment to be a lot more just and fair with a much much lesser um amount of uh, interference from your local uh, mafias uh, that exist that's the unfortunate truth when it comes to uh, building materials in india um but you know some of the failures that actually happened which you know we might have to dwell on Uh, before you know we come across uh, a solution would be the fact that uh, in the past about uh, two or three decades ago when uh, fly ash from thermal power plants was becoming a massive issue the government had um, issued directives uh, saying that you know you would only uh, that you know you're only required to manufacture fly ash based bricks and yet what we've seen is um, you know except for the government which constitutes only about 6 to 7% of the total market available in india no one else uses fly ash bricks in the uh, country anymore and that's simply down to the fact that uh, there was extremely poor regulation of the production process the standardization was there but it wasn't really uh, enforced uh, three there were problems with uh, uh you know just just the local uh, authorities right i mean uh, there were no laws on you know what sort of uh, the materials are put in and you know there are always ways through which you can um simply bypass uh, some of these uh, rules and laws the bylaws that exist uh so as a result of this what happened was we had way too many people come and manufacture these uh, bricks and blocks and slowly there was a price war uh because of which the quality of the materials suffered and consequently uh the quality of the product and the uh, the you know the image of the product also suffered significantly because of which now you don't see many 
um, fly ash brick manufacturers to supply uh, bricks and blocks to uh, private individuals. So uh, policy uh, policies could be made, and we've seen these uh, happening before. But unfortunately, um, the implementation, uh, the uh, you know. Uh, I, I, I'm fishing for the right word. I'm not able to get it, but you know, it's the uh, it's the authoritative implementation which is uh, basically lacking. That's the external factors that I would want to bring in. Thank you very much, Sagun. We'll come back to you again. I have a question for Siri. Do you think printing construction is very new and difficult to be convinced as a client and buyer? Do you have a proof of concept project like some global companies to instill some confidence? Yeah, uh, so uh, absolutely, I totally agree with that. And recently, a month ago, we have demonstrated that 3D printing can be achieved by printing a gazebo, which is of close to uh, five and a half feet by five and a half feet size. So we have demonstrated it to people from the construction industry and also Mr. Anand Mahendra. So, so we do have one at our, uh, in Hyderabad, inside Mahendra University. So you can definitely come and visit that sometime. So everyone also in the audience, um, with the Mova app, you can get in touch with um, the panelists here and also, of course, to LinkedIn and other social media channels. So then grab the chance and, and get in touch with them to visit their sites too. We have the next question for Tarun. Very interesting work and comments from you. As a note, net zero buildings in 2009 was one. Now it's almost 100. But even now, a small house or mid-sized builder idea of greener sustainable is LED or aerator. In short, ideally, how many more years do you think the market will be ready for green bricks? Uh, I was also reading the question. Um, again, I mean, that's true. But uh, what's actually quite interesting is... Um, um, the reason that, you know, people actually put in LEDs or aerators is not because it's green, but because it saves a ton of money. Um, and I guess it's only when people realize that, uh, uh, so th this is, this essentially needs to happen. Right? I mean, green premium does not really exist. I mean, it only exists because, um, you know, people wanted to create that aura of, um, uh, of, of that premiumness and therefore they wanted to, uh, you know, sell a greener product. Um, and, and, you know, they want to create that sort of a bragging right so that, you know, people can do it. But at the end of it all, you know, what's, what's interesting is uh, when something is truly green, it's actually going to be cheaper than the, the, uh, the virgin alternative. And considering the way uh, that, you know, we're actually uh, losing uh, important resources uh, and how resources are dwindling, uh, it's, it's soon, you know, there would be a time when, you know, greener alternatives are going to be cheaper than the uh, conventional ones. And that is when I think, uh, the pace at which this would uh, take off would soon look like a hockey stick. Um, and that's essentially how it works, right? I mean, um, it would take a little bit of time. Uh, I mean, even though it took all more than uh, a decade, uh, I think just a little bit patience more. And then uh, with the way uh, at which, you know, all these conventional materials are becoming uh, supremely expensive, um, this would essentially uh, get better. But there's an interesting comment there on how why AAC block does not really take off in the middle income houses. And that's simply because uh, it's not a great product. Um, and again, you have price wars that are happening. Uh, you have multiple manufacturers who want to supply these blocks at a much, much lower price because of which they sacrifice quality. Um, again, it brings me back to my earlier answer on how, you know, uh, we need a certain amount of uh, policy intervention and basically uh, strong willed implementation uh, for all of these issues to not creep up in the future. Thank you very much, Sharon. Again, policy, we are working towards, right? And um, Gautam and Anand, you're also working towards uh, you know, bringing shelter tech to the, to the pipeline of many, many also other accelerators or investors, uh, again, to be one of the, you know, 
important impact innovation categories. Gautam, what do you think, how can we reach that goal to really become a bit higher up in the impact innovation categories? Um, let me understand the question correctly. How do we reach uh, like more startups? How do you reach, uh, I'm sorry, I kind of missed that question a little bit. Exactly. So not just how do we reach more startups, but how can shelter tech as the term and the industry and the startups yeah. become really on the pipeline of, of others, not just the small group we're here in this panel? Sure. So, and you know, I'm going to uh, riff off, you know, a couple of questions that Tarun answered about policy. Uh, you know, I was at the ISTM where I think Green Jam, you were there. Uh, uh, Favo was there. And ISTM is a, you know, it's, it's a pretty large kind of an exhibition that the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs hosts every year. And, you know, to me, what was, what stuck? I mean, I, I'm, it disappointed me, of course, but there were like three startups in uh, about 50 or 60 stalls that, uh, you know, uh, the government had hosted. It's a mega event that they host every year. I think the next one's coming up in Rajkot uh, shortly. And, you know, uh, my problem is that, you know, anytime, you know, when the government's actually hosting, uh, you know, an event that basically, at least on paper, is, uh, you know, focusing on innovation in the industry, you know, you want to see more and more uh, out of the box type of approaches being highlighted. And, uh, but what we ended up having were large companies like LNT or Lafarge, you know, who've been around forever. And who've been basically, it was, and, and no, no blot on them. Okay. I mean, they're, they're amazing companies, great successes, et cetera. But are they your answer to, to, you know, uh, the housing challenge that, uh, and the housing demand that uh, basically exists uh, in this country for sure? How do we kind of highlight that and make sure that, you know, we are enabling channels for, uh, you know, companies like Green Jams, companies like Structure, uh, you know, that uses agri waste for creating alternate wood which is much better than engineered wood that we see today, like MDF or, or plywood or companies like uh, FAO. And, you know, you'd be surprised that it was very easy for these companies to get noticed there when no surprise again, because they were the only innovative companies in, in this, uh, you know, gathering of uh, 60, 70 uh, uh, companies, right? Now, that is where I think, you know, a lot of our work over the past, uh, you know, especially over the past 18 months or so has been, to uh, work closely with, uh, you know, government agencies, both centrally as well as uh, in uh, states like Karnataka and Tamil Nadu, uh, to basically elevate shelter tech or prop tech as a bona fide top tier sector. You know, fintechs got its share of glory. Pharma has, uh, you know, is something that, uh, you know, the government put its might behind. There is a biotechnology ministry in Karnataka, right? Now, you know, if you live in a, a house or if you work in an office, you know, you are affected by the built environment. It is something that, you know, we are just ignoring, uh, you know, the, the impact of, you know, if, if you are occupying any kind of space, there is a massive impact that you're going to be able to make if you just kind of allow people to come in and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, present their innovative ideas around it, whether it is, for me to live more efficiently or work more efficiently in an office like this, that is the opportunity. And I think, you know, uh, working closely with the authorities is one way to do it. But then on the other side, it's also with partnership, you know, the players like uh, Habitat for Humanity or Will Grow or Social uh, Alpha or, you know, Academia like Anand National University in Ahmedabad, right? Where, you know, these are organizations that are taking the lead in figuring out is there a policy uh, that exists today for, let's say, uh, CND waste? And how is that being deployed? Right. And how do we kind of set that into motion where there is greater adoption? Now, let's say a tier one developer like a Brigade or a Mahindra adopting green technologies goes a long way. You know, it is not just for the tier one luxury segment. It actually is validation where a lot of the tier two, tier three developers and cities start looking up to them as examples. And that is where, you know, the cost of technology needs to plummet down even at a greater pace than where it is at today. That is where, you know, we are looking at startups to come in and slap the authorities in the face. I'm sorry, I'm saying that, but, you know, it's like, you know, wake up and, and look at what the possibilities are. 
right? And that is where I think all of us are doing our bit, but I think we need to definitely do a whole lot more together. I don't know if it answered your question. It sounded like a rat to me. Sorry. It, it absolutely does. Okay, we we only have like three minutes left, so um, we'll take one last question, or I would like to address this to Anand, and we'll take the one from Gauri. Um, what could be a good strategy to reach out to the appropriate donor givers for the low income segment we work with? And they just did the first pilot house in a cyclone prone village in Tamil Nadu. And with that, I'm also combining the last question from Muji saying, um, what are actually the shelter tech startups? What are, what is their role? Because a lot of, um, communities live in, in slums are prone to extreme heat flooding and, and, and others. And, um, Please just give a very short answer, Anand, and everyone, again, you can still get in touch with the panelists via the different channels. Sure. I'll take uh, Ruchi's question first, and maybe that uh, holds a key to the answer to the other question as well. Um, I, I, you've asked about affordable housing uh, for low-income communities. So I, I would urge everyone to think, consider what is affordable, right? Does affordable mean low cost, low upfront cost, or does affordable mean something that is loan-worthy, finance-worthy, which can be which banks and other financial institutions will come in uh, to offer loans to, right? I, in my opinion, it's a latter. Uh, so when you say something is affordable, I think we should get out of this rat race of bringing the cost further and further down and you know expecting people to pay upfront. Uh, rather, we should make something which is sturdy, long lasting, which you can bring a bank to and they will not have any hesitation in, uh, you know, in using that, uh, you know, that uh, living space as a collateral to extend loans, in which case, uh, you know, you can actually uh, bring in these kind of uh, shelter tech innovations, uh, even to low income houses uh, and, and, uh, uh, and, and slum areas, right? And in a way that answers the first question about uh, how do you bring in donors, right? Now, the problem, uh, the reason why donors don't like to come into this area is because the impact numbers uh, or rather, the I would say the bang for the buck is so low, right? Because let's say if you're putting up, you have X amount of money to donate. Uh, obviously, if you put it to education, you can touch a lot more lives, right? But if you put it towards a house or uh, towards housing, then just because of the high cost of that uh, investment towards a house, the number uh, which you can touch through the same investment is a lot lower. And therefore, maybe the way to do it is then to encourage uh, you know, the, the donors to come in more as guarantors rather than as out, outright donors to see if, you know, they can start offering kind of uh, guarantee pools for people to actually, um, you know, uh, build their own houses or, or uh, uh, pay for their own houses through loans uh, where the donors stand as guarantors. Uh, this might actually work to convince more people to come into the sector. Uh, I hope that answered both the questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anand. And that was I, Can I just make question. one addition, uh, if you don't mind? If it's 10 seconds or less, yes. Absolutely. So I think you also have to focus on building a sustainable and scalable business, which will also be, you know, so that you're not entirely dependent on donor grants, right? Focus also on building a sustainable business that kind of sustains itself over a long period of time. Thank you very much. Okay. Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear audience, I hope you got these three things out, knowing what shelter tech is, heard many insights. I think we did that. And um, having some questions being answered. I hope that was the goal and you checked all the goals. Before I'm asking the panelists for the absolutely last question, I would like to highlight the keynote speech on the main stage at 6.30 p.m. with our Vice President Asia Pacific from Habitat for Humanity International, Luis Noda. So please get into, the, um, get into that session and watch Luis Noda as well. So thank you very much to the panelists. And the last question to all of them, please answer it in one word. Shelter tech is dot, dot, dot. Thank you again, Anand, Tarun, Gautam, and Siri, and let's start with Anand. I think for me, shelter tech uh, is uh, affordable innovation in, in the housing space. Sorry, that's not one word, but one Not one word, word, no. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, shelter, shelter tech is the need of the hour. It's thank critical. Siri? Uh, where? What was that said again? Hello? Shelter tech is in one word. We'll go to Tarun first. Uh, bread and butter. Siri? 
well it's very difficult to uh, put shelter tech in one word but i'll try and do um, a community community for real estate startups thank you so much uh, everyone have a wonderful day thank you so much for the discussion see you very soon